I wonder what would make you turn vegetarian. Have you ever thought about it? Would you give up meat? Sausages, pork chops, roast lamb, bacon, McDonald's burger, if that's your thing? Would you limit yourself only to ever choose the vegetarian pizza with the bits of onion on and never have the pepperoni? When you have pasta, would you only ever have it with tomato sauce and never with a bit of minced beef? What would make you turn vegetarian? Maybe you are already a vegetarian. I wonder why. If you are, I wonder if not, what it would take. Would you, if you started to think about animal rights, animal welfare? Or is it maybe more just the cost of living these days, the cost of meat, which would lead you to say, that's it, I'm not having meat anymore. I'm going to save money, just eat vegetables, beans and things. Or for some people today, it's actually concern for the environment, isn't it? The use of land and what we're doing to our planet in general with pollution and global warming. Eating meat, we're told, is part of all that. Some people are turning vegetarian for that reason. They want to protect the environment, conserve this planet. Maybe for some of you, it might even be a health thing. Your doctor tells you the meat you're eating is doing you harm. You're better off just eating vegetables. What would turn you vegetarian? I wonder if it's the same thing that made Paul think he might become a vegetarian. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13. I wonder if this reason would be enough to make you give up eating meat and just go for baked beans on toast or whatever it is. He says, I will never eat meat. He says, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 13, I will never eat meat if it makes my brother stumble. If food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. I'm concerned for my fellow Christians and their health and their strength as Christians, their spiritual health, their walk with the Lord. I don't want to put them off. I don't want to hinder them. I don't want to hurt them in their faith. And if this is what it takes, I'll give up eating meat. The motto for this series in 1 Corinthians is this. The church is the crater the gospel left behind. When Paul first visited Corinth, he took with him the spiritual equivalent of a thermonuclear device. When he told people about the Lord Jesus Christ and explained that Christ was the Son of God, who came and lived and died for our sins and rose again so that we might be righteous in the sight of God and will return to judge... That was the effect of detonating a massive explosion. But instead of the bomb that gives off energy and light and heat and radiation, this message came with the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. And instead of leaving behind a wasteland of rubble and radioactive waste, this powerful message left behind a church. The Corinthian church. And a big part of that for these Corinthians was that they needed to make a big change, many of them, in terms of their religious life. They needed to change their religious practice. They needed to understand, verse nine, uh, verse 6, I beg your pardon, they needed to understand that there is only one God. And there is only one Lord. Yes, Paul says, there are many so-called gods, many so-called objects of worship, many gods and many lords in inverted commas, but they don't exist. They're not real. This was news to the Corinthians. And for some of them, it meant a big change. Historians tell us that in first century Corinth, there was a whole load of different temples of all kinds of gods and goddesses. Every kind of Greek and Roman god you've ever heard of, some Egyptian ones thrown in as well for good measure. The archaeologists have found some of these. Ancient writers mention some of the others. Temple to Zeus, temple to Hera, temple to Isis and Osiris, Egyptian gods, temple to the Roman emperor, temple to this god and that god. Some of these were massive places, about 100 meters long and 25 meters wide. Huge, huge, massive buildings. There were six temples, apparently, no less than six, to Aphrodite, the goddess of love. 
And these Christians in Corinth, they've learnt from Paul that none of that is real. None of that counts for anything. None of that is worth anything. As it says elsewhere in the Bible, they turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. That's the Bible name for all these false gods. Idol, verse 4. An idol is a false god, a god that does not really exist. And Paul told them, and they believed and understood and accepted, all these Greek and Roman and Latin and Egyptian gods are idols. They're nothing. They stopped worshipping them. They stopped going to the temple. They gave up loving them and serving them and trusting them and fearing them. They said they are nothing. Now we belong to the true God. And did you know that if you become a Christian, you need to make the same change? Some of you have made that change. Some of you perhaps haven't realized that this is involved in becoming a Christian. There is one true God. So you don't need a a rabbit's foot in your pocket when you go for the exam or the job interview. You don't need it. There's one God. There's one true God. He gives life and peace to all. So you don't need when you go home to chant your Buddha statue for calmness. There's one true God. So why do you say, well, I come to God for salvation and heaven, but I go to the clairvoyant when I want to know my future? There is only one God. All the rest is nothing. Why do you, if you're converted from a pagan background, why do you still have the little statue of Ganesh or whoever it was? These are idols. They're nothing. When you become a Christian, you turn away from all of them to the true and living God for everything. See, he, in verse 9, is the one God, the Father, for whom we exist. Verse 6, I beg your pardon. From whom are all things, for whom we exist. Everything comes from him. Everything. And everything is to be for his glory. Everything. My glory, he says, I will not give to another. Not to a rabbit's foot, not to a Buddha statue, not to anything. You shall have no other gods before me, he says. Number one in the Ten Commandments. No other gods. And what he means is, you shall not have another god in my face. A wife might have another partner besides her husband. But she probably wouldn't do it in his face she would try to do it in secret and keep it from him but God says if you have another object of worship that's in my face that is not hidden from me and he says I the Lord your God am a jealous God so no wonder they turned to God from all these false gods and said from now on as far as we're concerned there is one God the Father from whom are all things and for whom we exist and that's it nothing else nothing more nothing besides no insurance policy nothing to help when I'm in trouble or I get stuck this is God and there is no other and in the same verse one Lord always the two together one God the Father One Lord, Jesus Christ. One God. Two different persons. Three persons, actually, when you mention the Holy Spirit. But Paul often talks about the two, the Father and the Son, together. And leaves the Holy Spirit out of the picture for the time being. But he says, these are one, God and Lord. And yet they're separate persons. So they do different things with regard to each other. They're not interchangeable. They're not identical. There's the Father and the Son. The Father from whom are all things, for whom we exist. The Son through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. But as far as we're concerned, the point is this. You never get one without the other. You're never going to have God without having Jesus Christ. You're never going to know God unless you know Jesus Christ. The Father and the Son, as far as we're concerned, they are one God. They're inseparable. In their relationship with each other, they're different. They have different roles. But to us, they come together. We meet them both. So, what does this mean then if you live in a place like Corinth, that there's only one God? Remember, this place is still full of all these temples. 
there's still all these people going and worshipping all these other gods all around you. It's not like a, a secular society like ours is where everybody says, oh, I don't believe in anything. Everybody else in Corinth still believes in all these other gods. And here you are in your church saying they're all nothing, they're all nothing. What does that mean for you? A lot of the meat that people ate in Corinth, this comes back to this business of being a vegetarian, you see, a lot of the meat that people ate in Corinth came from these temples. Not all of it, but a lot of it did. So if you went to the butchers, if you went to the meat market in town and bought your leg of lamb to roast at home, you wouldn't know. Did they use it this morning in temple worship or did it just come from the farm? I don't know. But to these Corinthians, it didn't really matter. They said to themselves, the idols are nothing, these other gods are nothing. I can just eat the meat, it's just meat, that's all it is. If you went to someone's house, a relative, and you know they go to the temple to worship, did they take an animal this morning and sacrifice it and then bring it back and roast it for you, a chicken perhaps for you to eat for your dinner with them? Or did they just get it from the farm? You don't know. Was it used in pagan worship? Should you eat it if it was used in pagan worship? In chapter 10, Paul tells him, yes, it doesn't matter. These gods are nothing. It's just meat. It's just meat. These temples, we're told, even had dining rooms in them, the larger ones, where people could eat. You could go there and have a meal. It's kind of a restaurant where you could go with your family or the people from work. And you could sit and have a meal in one of these temples. And evidently, this was something that these Corinthians also would do. Verse 10, you have knowledge and you're eating in an idol's temple. Well, that's not wrong in itself. The idols are nothing. The temple is nothing. These gods don't exist. There's only one God and Father. There's only one Lord Jesus Christ. But, and Paul says, you're right in this, actually. What you say is right. You're right in this freedom you allow yourselves. You're right not to draw lines at this point. You're right not to be too pernickety. Just, just eat the meat. Just eat in the temple. The food that you eat, verse 8, doesn't recommend you to God. Doesn't matter whether you eat. Doesn't matter whether you don't eat. In itself, it's not a big deal. Food does not recommend us to God. We're no worse off if we do not eat. No better than we do if we do Paul says, I agree with you about this. He says, the knowledge that you have at this point is good. But take care, verse 2, that your great knowledge does not puff you up, make you proud and arrogant, hard-hearted and thoughtless and careless. Take care how you use this knowledge you have. There are some people, verse 7, who still have those false gods in their hearts. Some of you fellow Christians with you in church, they still have these different gods, Aphrodite and Zeus and so on, in their hearts. You can go to the temple and have your family meal there and it doesn't mean anything to you. But if they went, they would be worshipping. They would be worshipping these gods in the way that they used to do. Yes, they're weak. They don't have the knowledge that you have. They don't have the understanding that you have. They don't see so clearly that these gods are nothing. You're right in that knowledge. But do you want to harm them in that way? Do you want to see them led into false worship of false gods? Is that really where you want to go? You think your knowledge is a good thing. Take care, it doesn't become a damaging, a harmful thing. Take care of this right of yours, does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak, verse 9. Paul explains how this could happen, verse 10. There you are, then, you're eating with your family in the temple. And uh, these, these weaker Christians, they see you there, they hear that you've been there. And they say to themselves, well, it must be okay then. So and so does it, so it must be okay. So and so is a Christian, and he eats in the temple. So it must be okay for me to eat in the temple. I thought I had to avoid it. Now I'm a Christian. I thought I had to stay away. I thought I had to only worship one God and one Lord. I thought I had to make a break with idolatry. But if he's eating in the temple, it must be okay for me to go there then and worship in my heart. That's the weaker brother, the weaker sister. Yes, 
They don't have the understanding. But do you want to make them fall? If anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? Do you want to be part of that? It's not easy to see exactly what would be like that in our world today. It's not exactly, because we're not living in Corinth, we're not living surrounded by these different temples. It's difficult to see exactly what would be an equivalent in our church life. But I've come up with something that I think is not entirely dissimilar. Supposing we're having a church lunch, which we haven't had for a while because of COVID and so on, but suppose we're having a church lunch, and you say to yourself, I'm going to take some beer to that church lunch. I'm going to take some packs of beer cans. We're free to drink alcohol, you say to yourself. The Bible is clear on that. Jesus turned water into wine. Paul told Timothy to drink a little wine for his stomach. We're free to drink. We've got liberty in this. We've got freedom. Your knowledge at that point is correct. What you say is true. But what effect will this have? You're happy, are you then, as a strong, knowledgeable Christian, to have a beer with a meal and stop there? You know, do you, as a Christian, that you're not going to go on and get drunk because the Bible says don't get drunk. Do not be drunk on wine. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, Ephesians 5. You know you're going to have one beer in the church lunch there in front of everybody and you're going to offer the other people there one beer because we're all free in Christ and this is not a command of God not to drink. You're going to exercise that freedom. You're going to exercise that knowledge, are you, in the, in the church lunch? What you don't know is the state of the other people there. What about that person who doesn't drink nowadays because drinking was part of their old pre-Christian life? And in their heart, they feel, I cannot drink and follow Jesus. Well, biblically, that's not exactly correct, but that's how they see it. Are you going to push them against their conscience? Are you going to encourage them by holding out a beer can to them and saying, drink? Would that be a good thing? Would that help them? What about the guy who stopped drinking relatively recently, the new Christian, because whenever he drinks, he has a can or a pint or whatever it is, and he can't stop at one. He just can't. There's always number two and number three, and probably number four and five as well. He's never just had one drink in his life. And you're going to offer him one drink. What's going to happen? You've got to think about the people around you. You've got to think, yes, I'm strong, I've got this great Bible knowledge, I understand these things, but not everybody does. Not everybody's at that point. I've got freedom to do this. Yeah, okay. But how's it affecting other people? What example are you setting? What is your example doing to the other Christians around you, weak as some of them may be? Could you, verse 11, could you, by your knowledge, destroy this weak person, this brother for whom Christ died? Could you do that? What a thought. Could your example as a Christian actually destroy a person for whom the Lord Jesus Christ died? Is that possible? Could you, by your example, lead someone so precious to the Lord Jesus, he gave his life for him, and your example leads him to death and hell and destruction? Is that possible? Well, thank God it's not ultimately possible. (laughs) You cannot ultimately destroy the person for whom Christ died. Thank God. Christ paid for his sins. You cannot undo that. You cannot overturn that. If Christ said, this is mine, he is mine. He belongs to me. I took responsibility for his sins at the cross. I answered for him when I died. You cannot overturn that. The person who he saved is saved. The person for whom he died will live with God in heaven. You can't overturn that. But Paul isn't going here into the details of theology. He wants to wake up his Christian readers. He's shocking them. He's saying to them, you want to avoid anything like this? Anything that might put somebody on a road 
that could possibly lead them to destruction if they followed it to the end. Anything that could possibly harm, let alone destroy, a brother for whom Christ died. You want to avoid it. See, think of it this way. Do you ever pray for things that God has promised? I do. Do you ever see a promise in the Bible and pray that God will fulfill that promise? That seems a strange idea, doesn't it? God says he's going to do it, so why are you praying for it? He's already said he's going to do it. It's a promise. He promised, for example, that he'd build his church. So why do we pray for him to build his church? Well, of course, what we're praying is do it here, do it now. Do it among us, do it in a big way. Build this church here today. I think something similar is true with this verse 11. God is telling you not to do an impossible thing that you couldn't do if you tried. You couldn't do it. You shouldn't want to do it. You shouldn't want to do anything like it. You shouldn't want to set a bad example to another Christian that would weaken them or harm them or cause them to stumble in their Christian walk, verse 13, or wound their conscience, verse 12, or harm their weak conscience, verse 10, or become a stumbling block to the weak, verse 9, or defile their conscience, verse 7. You should want nothing to do with any of these things. So, okay, so you're not going to bring beer to a church lunch. I don't suppose anybody would ever have thought of doing that. What can we do with our example as Christians that could be positive or negative? How does the way I'm living my Christian life affect you? How does the way you're living your Christian life affect me and the other Christians in your church? You might be a strong, well-grounded, biblically-minded Christian. But do you want that knowledge, verse 1, to puff you up and make you proud? So that you look at some of the other people in your church and say, they don't know the Bible like I do. I'm ahead of them. I'm more mature than they are. Well, you've got more knowledge than they have. It's not the same thing. Knowledge puffs up. Do you want to have in your heart the love that builds up that you care about the Christians around you, whether they're doing well or badly? I mean, you'd be shocked, wouldn't you, if there was some terrible health and safety lapse in this church. If we, I don't know, if we say if we, church lunch again, say if we served up a, a church lunch and the meat was off. You'd be shocked. How careless can they be? They're trying to poison people. That's so unloving. We should have an equal concern, a greater concern for people's spiritual health. Is that brother flourishing? Is my example helping him? Is that sister who's a new Christian, whose Bible knowledge is very limited, is she growing? Is my example pointing her the right way? We need to think about each other. We need to have a love that builds up. And actually... The next one, two, three, four, five, six chapters of Corinthians are on this theme. Love that builds up. How do you strengthen other Christians? And the message here is by your example. At least don't hinder them by your example. At least don't put them off by your example. So think about the life that you live as a Christian then. How does it impact other Christians around you? Dare I be so bold to mention at this point the whole question of church attendance. Somebody's a new Christian. So the pastor or the elder says to them, right, you're a new Christian, you need to change your life. Your life now belongs to Jesus, and particularly your Sundays belong to Jesus and his church. We expect to see you in church every Sunday, morning and evening. That's what they need to do. It's a new life. How are they going to learn? How are they going to grow? They need to make that commitment without any ifs and buts around the edges. But they see you, a mature Christian, they think, who knows the Bible well with knowledge coming and going I think oh that must be okay then it must be okay not to be in church it must be alright if I'm here now and then that's what those people are doing and they know much more about it than I do so it must be alright the pastor must have been exaggerating I don't have to take that seriously at all and maybe this is a very big maybe maybe 
you, as a Bible-knowledgeable Christian, can thrive coming to church now and then. Maybe. That's a very big if. But the new Christian who sees you certainly will not thrive. You don't want your example to cause them to stumble. One reason, not the only reason, but one reason to be here regularly as a believer who wants to build up other people, the example that you set. Maybe you can think of other instances as well where your example will count. But I think underneath all this, that question in verse 1 comes back to us. Am I somebody who loves to think of myself as big and important, well established because of my knowledge? Or do I want to love and serve other people in the church? Do I want to put other people's needs and concerns ahead of my own? Knowledge will make me look at the new Christian, the less understanding Christian, the Christian who doesn't know the Bible and say to myself, how weak you are. How weak you are. How different I am from you. Love will make you look at that weaker Christian and say, how can I help you? How can I help you? Knowledge will make you look at somebody who doesn't understand the Bible very well and gets things wrong and says the wrong thing. Knowledge will make you say, I am superior at this point. Love will leave you saying, how can I serve you? This brother, enormously precious, this brother, this sister for whom Christ died, love them. And look at verse 3 as we finish. Loving your brother, your sister Christian, all is part of loving God. It's all the same thing. If you love God, you love the Christians around you, all of them, strong and weak, mature, immature, well-taught, ignorant. You love them because you love God, because you love their God, because you love the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who died for them. You love them. And only if you love God, verse 3, can you say you're known by God. Only if you love God. Love the brothers and sisters. Show a good example in your Christian life. If you love them, you love God, you're known by God. God knows you. God will acknowledge you. God will say, he is mine, she is mine. She belongs to me, he belongs to me. If you love God. Let's pause there and pray.